um, we are discussing precise exceptions. Um, so these are exceptions that happen um, within a certain instruction and are restorative. So that's the definition of a precise exception. Um, and the name comes from the fact that um, when the exception happens, the system state is such that everything before it has completed and nothing after it uh, has started. So, so the system state is precise in that sense when the, when the exception gets handled. And um, these are exceptions that happen within an instruction. So an instruction executes while it goes to the pipeline. Uh, in some stage, it raises an exception. Um, however, not all within instruction exceptions may be precise. Okay, right? But precise exceptions are always within instruction, which means a precise exception is always tagged with a particular instruction. And that's why the restartable clause is important because it says that after you handle the exception, you should be able to resume the instruction and execute it successfully. Right? So uh, yeah, so exception occurring in some pipeline stage and the exception must be taken transparently, meaning that you uh, save state transfer control to the operating system, and then restore state and resume it. In a pipeline processor, an instruction may take an exception deep into the pipeline. For example, it may happen in the memory stage. It could take a page form, for example. Um, by this time, quite a few subsequent instructions are already moving in the pipeline. Right? Um, next few instruction must have been fetched, something must have been decoded, Something must have been executed already, right? right? Because um, if you if you look at the uh, pipeline timing, when this instruction gets to mem, uh, the next one is in x. Uh, next to next is in decode, and another is being fetched, right? Okay. So that means by the time the exception happens, there are three more instructions inside the pipeline. Um, so, and, 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 to, and to maintain the precise semantic, you have to do something to make sure that these instructions do not get to complete, all right? They do not get to modify any state of the processor. And of course, you have to make sure that everything above it has completed by the time you take the exception, all right? Because um, the previous instruction is currently right back, okay? So, um, the way it is done is that um, each instruction carries an exception vector with it, which tells if this instruction took an exception and if yes, in which stage. Right. So um, it, it's, it's called a vector because um, usually the length of the vector is equal to the number of pipe stages. So you mark that corresponding bit uh, on if, if, for example, uh, if an instruction takes an exception in x stage, we mark the third bit on okay, and so on. Um, the vector is examined at the end of mem or beginning of write back stage because notice that the write back stage cannot raise an exception. So when you are in the write back stage, you know that you are done, right? You, can, you have no, no further computation left. The only thing that you need to do is you store your result back to the corresponding register, okay, all right? So write back stage is usually exception free and that's why this is the stage where you usually check this vector. Okay, that Tell me if this instruction should write to the register or not. Okay. So in case of a marked exception, um, all pipe stages are fed with zeros um, to turn off any state change. So essentially what I'm saying is that, suppose this particular instruction takes a page fault right, in memory stage. So you mark that vector. And when this instruction reaches the write back stage, you examine the vector. And the vector says that, oh, this instruction actually took an exception. So now you have to actually nullify the instructions which are already in the pipeline, okay, right? So that's exactly what you're saying. Um, all pipe stages are going to be fed with zeros so that essentially they are no ops. So they move through the pipe, they do nothing, all right? And, and in our five stage pipe, we know that by the time this instruction in the right back stage, the previous one has completed, okay, all right? So this is in fact enough to maintain preciseness.
as long as you do this, you know that nothing after this particular instruction um, has done anything in the, in the process of state. And then what happens is a trap instruction is fetched, and that controls uh, that transfers control to the operating system. And the trap handler saves the program counter of the accepting instruction so that after the exception is handled, you can restore the program counter and start execution from there. So program counter of this instruction will be saved. This is a general mechanism trait to do. Okay, so um, yeah, so a processor is said to support precise exception if all instructions before the accepting instruction execute normally. All instructions after the accepting instruction do not change any program or visible state of the processor. And after the exception is handled, if it is restartable, execution must begin at the accepting instruction. Okay. Interior pipeline must implement restartable exceptions to be able to implement page faults and TLD uses. Okay. Uh, these are the two highly required restartable exceptions that we have to implement. What is a TLD? Does anybody know? Cancellation look aside. Look aside? Buffer. Okay. Why is it used? Is it something edible? Or you can wear? What is it? Sorry? What is it? Page table and cache. Cache is a page table entries, exactly. So this is a small structure that caches the recently used page table entries. Yeah. What about the floating point pipeline? So this becomes very tricky. So we'll, we'll soon talk about this actually. The, the, the fundamental problem here is that the pipelines don't really look like this. So by the time a particular instruction completes, there is no guarantee that the previous instruction is completed. Because this instruction could be an addition instruction. If you remember our pipeline, addition and a latency, latency of four cycles. Right? This instruction might be a multiplication, which takes longer. So there is no such guarantee that by the time this instruction completes, the previous one is completed. And there is no other, no such guarantee that by the time this instruction raises an exception, nothing after it um, has completed. Because it could be that this instruction is, a, is, a, is an instruction with latency less than the add instruction. So by the time it raises an exception, this is already completed. So now how do you really uh, maintain precise yeah. So So we'll uh, talk about this soon. Uh, normally, the way uh, this is handled is uh, there are two floating point modes uh, supported in processors. One is called an imprecise mode, and the other one is a precise mode. Um, in precise mode, overlapping between floating point instructions is limited and usually um, at least an order of magnitude smaller. Okay. So the imprecise mode has no problem. Essentially, you can ignore all exceptions. Okay, all right. So it is designed to give you performance. So we'll talk about how exactly you can um, um, implement a precise mode. First of all, that's what needs to be you know, thought about. Right? How can I implement a precise mode in a direct programmable performance? Right? So we'll talk about that. So let's first take a look at the integral pipeline. Okay. Um, so we have this. So this is our five-stage pipe, right? So first, need, first thing we need to understand is what kind of exceptions uh, that will arise in each of the five stages. So in the first stage, the fetch stage, what can happen? You can have a page form. You are trying to fetch an instruction, and the instruction page is not in there. So that's an instruction page form. Um, you can run into memory protection exceptions. You may be trying to access uh, some other's uh, code or some other's data. Right? Or you may be trying to access your own data in the fetch stage. Right? So that will lead to protection violation. Could there be a misaligned access in the fetch stage? Is that possible? So in MIPS, our instructions are four byte aligned. So can I have a misaligned access in the fixed stage? Is that possible? Which essentially means can I have a misaligned PC ever? Can my program counter be not a modulo, not zero modulo four? Is that possible? So what are the sources of PC? We have a bunch of sources, right? It can be PC plus 4, it can be predicted. Um, really, if it is PC plus 4 all the time, it cannot be ever uh, non zero modulo 4. It will be always 0 modulo 4. What about the predicted pieces? Can they be smart? When we are in the director, 
So conditional jump instructions uh, will um, will assume the last two bits to be zero. We shift in the last two bits, and then J R jumps. Okay. There is no shifting, right? But how can I have a non-legitimate target? Yeah? I, I said that it can happen. How? Oh. Sorry, say it. Yeah? In the address is specified in the instructions. But there is only one instruction in loops that is jump. But that shifts in the last two bits. There is no other instruction, which is really okay. So it has to do with uh, indirect jumps. The question is so indirect jump instructions take your target from a register. How can you get a wrong register? That's the only way to get something that is misaligned. Hazard. Well, assume that the pipeline is correct. The talk of CR. Otherwise, it would be, it'd be stupid, right, to think, talk about these things. So, what do you mean? So, these instructions are read from a register, so. No, these instructions are not read from a register. The target would come from the register. Come from register. Yes. So the value in the register can be can be anything. I'm, I'm asking how, how can that happen? If you're using a compiler generated code, it cannot happen, right? In case of misprediction. Okay. It can predict something which is not the instruction. Uh, how how does it happen? Predictions are coming from the branch target buffer, which stores previously seen targets, right? It doesn't hook up anything, actually. It stores only what it has seen previously. So they cannot be wrong. They cannot at least be, they cannot be missing. Okay. So, what if you, let's say you miss a branch, right? So the predicted target is something, which is a legitimate uh, instruction. Right? So you are going along the predicted path and you may encounter a return instruction. But there was no matching call with this because you are just going along the wrong path. You shouldn't be going along this path. Okay. In the correct execution, you should never be taking this path without taking some other path on which you actually call the particular procedure. So now you have a return instruction which is an interest job and use a register as a target and that register content was never set to anything it holds something that so that can lead to a misaligned action does anybody follow what I just said? so I have a branch somewhere in my program so through some control path I have reached a point okay this one also may be predicted okay all right and here I take a prediction, I go, I'm going along this path and here I encounter a return statement. The point is that through whatever path I came, there was no procedure call statement. Simply because this path is wrong actually. I shouldn't be following this path at all. But because of prediction I am following this path and I encounter this JR $31. Okay. $31 was never saved because only if you have a corresponding JAL or JLR instruction, you would actually put the return address in $31. But you never came across any such instruction. Because this whole thing is actually wrong. You're going along a predicted path. Okay. So why does it take this path? Because of a prediction. You will always be inside a function. Yes, that's right. So there has to be a return address obviously. 
Yes, provided uh, that register has not been saved to stack. Um, it will be saved and only if there is something new to write into it. That's right, so that's not it. Suppose your procedure wants to use this register for storing some temporary computation there. Right? So it's saved onto memory, but hasn't been restored. And then you start going along the wrong path and suddenly encounter this and start using dollar thirty one content. Which is probably a data sitting there, some data value. So anyhow we are having it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's a thirty two bit value, so it just interprets this as the program counter. You could do that, what I'm suggesting. So when you execute a JAL instruction, you could actually store only the, the you know, uh, 30 bits or something. You could do that, but which doesn't do that. So um, this will happen with very low likelihood in this pipeline. This will happen if you have a deeper pipe. And this will happen if instructions start executing out of the program order, which we'll discuss very soon. Okay. So we'll revisit this example again. But keep in mind that it can happen. Misaligned access in, in, the, in the feature because of execution along this predicted path. Um, and this arises particularly from indirect jumps, where you end up using a wrong register to take the target. Okay. Second stage, decoder. Um, Illegal opcode again arises because of same reason, because of this predicted path. Um, so he, I, I would actually use the same example. It could happen that in such a case, actually this turns out to be an aligned access. So the fetcher doesn't know, it innocently goes and fetches whatever is there in that particular address. I mean, it interprets the content as an address, goes and fetches whatever is there. It may be completely a garbage value, doesn't even make sense to the decoder. So it immediately raises an illegal opcode exception in the second stage. Okay. Third stage can have arithmetic exception. For example, um, in integer pipeline, the only exception that can happen is sign overflow. So you can go and look up your list of instructions. This is the only bad thing that can happen in the third stage. Okay. Right. Uh, fourth stage can have page faults, memory protection, and misaligned accesses. Um, again. This, this MIPS compiler is actually very careful about this. So legitimate load store operations will never have misaligned addresses, okay. except for those LWL, LWR, SWL, SWR. So this, will can, this can again happen because of execution along misprinted paths. Okay. We'll start using wrong addresses and uh, we'll start doing uh, wrong things. Right back stage doesn't have any exception. Any question? So um, now the problem is, in the same cycle, multiple instructions can take exceptions. And even worse, exceptions can occur out of order. So let's take a look at that. So consider this particular instruction and this instruction. Okay, We're looking at these two instructions. All right. So this instruction in the mem stage may not be this one. Okay, let's take this one. Better. Okay, this one and this one, these two instructions. Okay. This instruction can take an exception in the mem stage. This instruction can take an exception in the fetch stage. So a later instruction can actually take an exception earlier in time. Right? This instruction will actually, this exception will show up earlier than this exception in the pipeline because this is how my time goes. Okay. So that's exactly what he's saying. Exception can occur out of order. Okay. And in the same cycle, multiple instructions can make exception. So you can look at this cycle, right? There could be exception here, 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 here. All these four instructions can raise exception in the same cycle. So uh, we have already devised a method to handle this. So exception vector associated with each instruction provides a way to handle this in order because we say that, well, let this instruction take an exception. I'm not going to handle it immediately. Okay. I'll only mark it in the exception vector. Finally, when this instruction which is the right back stage, I'll actually handle the exception. Fortunately, by then, this exception would already have been handled, so that this instruction will actually not be in the pipeline anymore. Okay. 
Because we said that when you handle the exception, we'll feed zeros in the pipe. So these three instructions will actually get nullified. So when the, this exception is handled, the exception restarts, this instruction re-executes, then again, this instruction will appear in the pipeline, may take again an exception, and we'll handle it later. Okay. So exceptions will be handled one after another, exactly in the program, because of this exception vector. Okay. Any questions? So, yes. So you were saying when, the, when we actually handle the exception, at that point we feed zero in the pipeline. Yeah. So suppose that the third instruction did, did a, a, page, a page found record during instruction fetch. This one? Yeah, this one. Yeah. So there won't be any instructions of, it can't read anything from the right. instruction fetch would actually stop. No, it will not stop. So it will return some the Whatever in the IFID batch, we will just carry it forward. It doesn't matter what it is. It will mark the exception vector as a single bit in the fetch stage. And that's it. It will probably not fetch anything. Sorry? Why? Because right back, you are just writing for register. What kind of exception can you have? Sorry? Who, which, which is what is protected? Registers are not protected. Registers, don't, they don't belong to you. They belong to the processor. Any other question? Is this clear? How I handle exceptions in a standard five stage pipe? So a few small um, problems that we have to worry about. So I mentioned this because um, you will have to handle system calls in your second assignment. And these, these system calls are actually exceptions. Okay. So the handling will be exactly the same and you'll face the exact same problems. So one small problem arises about the branch delay slot. So let's try to understand why, um, why is it really special? Why is it different from others? Okay, right? So let's suppose that you have a load instruction in the branch delay slot, okay, taking an exception. Right? So essentially, uh, so I have a branch instruction. And in the delay slot, I have a load instruction. And then I'll have either the target or the fall through, depending on which way the branch goes. Okay. So let's assume that um, the load in the branch delay slot takes an exception. All right. So the question is, how do you really handle this? The problem is, um, depending on where the exception is taken. So clearly, so first of all, to maintain the preciseness of exception you cannot execute the next instruction at this point. Okay. You have to take the exception of the load, come back, re-execute the load, and then only you can re-execute execute the next instructions. Which essentially means, when you take this exception of the load, you have to remember which way the branch is out. Because then only you will know which PC to use after the load instruction. So the exception PC is this one, this instruction. Okay, all right. So in the normal case, you will only remember this PC. And that's it. Okay, right? So if you only do that, the problem is you take the exception, then you resume execution here. What is the next PC? Is it PC plus 4? May not be. You have to remember which way the branch is out, the previous instruction. Right? It could be PC plus 4 or it could be some target instruction. Okay. So there are two solutions. Let the branch PC be the exception PC. So essentially what you do is you take the exception, but start execution from here. You re-execute the branch. Then you execute the load and then continue. Okay. Then you don't have to remember which way the branch is out. The second option is you remember multiple PCs and some more states. Essentially, you, you remember the load PC and also you remember the next PC to execute after the load. Okay. So of course, the good news is that um, in none of the codes that are handed to you for the assignment, they are only a system call in the branch in the state. So, um, you'll actually never face this particular problem. That an instruction in the load branch is not taking an exception. Okay. All right. And of course, um, we, we do not model page faults or anything in our simulator. So there is no question of having uh, 
a load instruction taking an exception or otherwise. So the only exception in your second assignment are system calls. That, that's what you have to handle. So this case will not arise in your assignment. Okay, so now the harder problem. What about the floating point pipeline? So first let's try to understand why this is harder. So just to remind you, um, we had this uh, floating point adder which had a four cycle latency. Um, the multiplier had seven cycle latency and the divider had 25 cycle latency, right? So um, what can happen in the pipeline is that um, So let's suppose I have a multiplication operation. Okay. So your book actually puts a memory stage here, which I'm ignoring because the multiplier doesn't need a memory stage. Okay. Uh, things, does, things really don't change if you put a new stage here. All right, so that's the multiplication instruction. Okay. Suppose the next instruction is an add instruction. So what will it look like? Okay. Right. So let's suppose that this multiplication instruction raises an exception in stage M7, the last year of the pipeline. By now, the add instruction is complete. It has written back on it. Right. How do you maintain precise exception in this case? So that's exactly what the first point says there. Instruction is complete on the order. Is the problem clear to everybody? Now, somehow, to, to maintain preciseness, you have to recover the, the working value for by this instruction. For example, this instruction could be um, something like this, f2, comma, f0, comma, f2, okay. A double position add, let's say. So it has overwritten f2 already. You have to recover that value to maintain preciseness. Okay. So that when this instruction goes into the operating system's exception handler, um, the, the way see the precise state of the process. It knows that everything before it has completed and everything, nothing after it has started. Okay, so now, and, and also there could be other problems. Think about the previous instruction, okay, right? This instruction could be a division instruction. Etc. It will take 25 cycles. Okay. So now, if you, if you try to replicate the solution that we are trying to do for integer pipeline with, with an exception vector, that doesn't really work, because by the time this instruction reaches right back, when I when I'm examining its exception vector, there is no guarantee that this instruction is completed, and there is no guarantee that this instruction has not completed. Okay, so this might have completed, this may not have completed. So that doesn't really work anymore. You have to do something else to maintain preciseness. So here are four solutions. One is the imprecise mode. That's the easy way out. You say that I don't offer you precise exception, but you get good performance. Okay. The second solution is to have a history file. Can anybody guess what it might be from the name? What could be a history file? Sorry, say again. Right, exactly. So um, before it overwrites a register, it saves the register to a separate register file. Okay, that's called a history file. It tells you what the value was before this instruction. So how does it help in maintaining this instruction? How do I use a history file? So if you're writing to the same register, mm -hmm. for example, in the multi plan add instruction. Yep. So when you write that uh, for the multi plan, yeah. then you'll know that add has already been written that. Okay. So then you can use the uh, previous value. No, why why is it uh, um, why do you want them to write the same register? What if they write the they write different registers? Then there is a problem? Then also there can be a problem. 
So I, I basically, see the point of precise exception is that I don't want anything to be modified after this, if the multiplication is taking an exception. Okay, so whatever register this add instruction is written to must be recovered now. Okay. And that's what you use to recover the history file. Before you allow the add instruction to, in this stage, before you allow this instruction to write to F2, you actually save the previous value of F2 in the history file. Okay, so um, and when do you finally copy the value to the main register file? Sorry, say on restarting the execution. No, so the, the new value is already in the register file, right? In the main register file, it's already written, written back. We are handling the exception. No, no, I'm saying with the history file, the new value is already written to the main register file. The history file stores the old value. Already. That's it. So you don't have to do anything extra as such. You just get it for free, right? Um, is that okay? So what is the, the register is being written multiple times? Ah, yes. So, so what if I have another add instruction here? So this one also completes before the multiplication gets to the right back stage when I examine the exception vector. Right? And this instruction may be written to F2 also. So now what do I do? Now my history file will actually have the value of this instruction, not the previous value. So I want the value before this instruction. But that's now going to be overwritten by this particular value. Because every time you update a register in the main file, whatever the main file is having, you copy that into the history. Is the problem clear to you? So what do you do? I'll resolve this. Sorry? You do not? Let it do a right back. The second. Only one right is allowed in the history. So what so you stall the instruction? Okay, so that's one possible solution. So what he's suggesting is that you have a bit vector, length equal to number of registers. And if one register is already written to the history file, you mark that bit. So that this, uh, this instruction comes to write back, that bit is already marked, so you say cannot write. How long do you keep that bit enabled? How do you disable that bit? So some structure will have to maintain this order, right? So that you have to you have to essentially have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the instruction and a history file entry. Okay, right? So you need a separate FIFO which actually maintains this particular order of fetch. Whenever you fetch an instruction, you enqueue that in the FIFO. All right? So instructions will actually be removed from the FIFO in, the, in that order. So that will make sure that whenever an instruction is removed from the FIFO, you know that now that history file entry can be overwritten. Okay. You free the history file entry in that sense. So it's not at as easy as say it, that you know, you have a history file and boom, we are done. No. There are many small things you have to take care of. The other option is the future file. Okay. So probably you can guess now what that means. So essentially what I mean is that, well, in this case, you don't actually change F2 in the main file. You store it somewhere else. Okay. That tells you what the future value is. The main file doesn't change in this case. So in this case, now what will have to happen is, um, this is actually um, uh, when this, you still have to maintain this before. Whenever an instruction goes out of the FIFO, you copy that value from the future file into the main file. Okay. Because now that value becomes visible to everybody. So, all right? So do you have here also this multi-version problem, which you had in the history file? Multiple versions of values? I can have the same instruction added to the same register, right? Okay, so, so I'll have the same problems here. Okay. All right. So, so now essentially what you can do is since you are maintaining this FIFO anyway, why don't you have with each entry of the FIFO, 
a value field which stores the value that this construction is produced. Okay, that will become your future file. Right? So essentially, uh, we have a FIFO queue. Whenever this instruction is fetched, we'll put this instruction ID here, and also it will have a value field, which will be populated by the value this instruction produces. And whenever this is this will move out of the queue, you move this value to the main file. Okay. That automatically takes care of these multiple versions. Yeah. Also now reading the values, uh, you have to uh, read from the future file the next instruction. You have to. Yes. So you right. have to yes. bypass. Ah, right. Exactly. Your future file now becomes part of your bypass network. Because what if the next instruction needs F2? Where will it get it from? The main file doesn't have the most upgrade value. It's here sitting actually in the queue. So you have to bypass from the future file. Okay. So anyway, so none of these actually um, is an easy solution. It both have both have com complications. Um, so the the, the P6 architecture um, um, enhances the future file to a retirement register file. We'll talk about P6 uh, once we um, cover a few more concepts. And, and the P6 microarchitecture is used in Pentium Pro, Pentium 2, and Pentium 3. So these, these processors actually use um, this particular structure. It's called a retirement register file, this particular whole queue. It has a certain size, of course, which essentially means that if this queue is full, you cannot fetch anymore. You have to stop. All right. So we'll talk about this, this queue in, in more detail later. It has various other names and all. Um, but just keep in mind that it is, an, it is essentially maintaining the order of instructions, the order in which they are fetched. Right. Any question on history file and future file? OK. Um, the other solution is you can let the software handle preciseness. That is, uh, forget about uh, whatever is completed, whatever is partial, uh, whatever is unfinished. Uh, what happens is that whenever this, let's say this multiplication instruction is taken an exception, when this one reaches right back, I check its exception vector, immediately there's an exception. Okay. Without worrying about what happens to the instructions before it, what happens to the instructions after it. So. Um, so the software handler that is going to handle the exception will have the responsibility to finish the incomplete instructions and ignore the completed ones and resume after the last completed instruction. So some of the instructions may, be, may already be completed here. Right? So it will actually resume execution after the last completed instruction, wherever that is. The last solution is issue only if all instructions are guaranteed to complete without taking exceptions. Okay, this is a very hard thing to guarantee, actually. So essentially what I'm saying here is that um, you detect exceptions as early as possible. So um, if possible, um, whenever you're issuing an instruction, you ask the following question. Tell me that, tell me if the instructions that were before me will take an exception or not. Okay. So you're asking the decoder this question. So whenever you issue this load instruction here, you ask all the instructions that are currently in the pipeline before me, will they take an exception or not? If the answer is yes, then you stall, the, stall this instruction. You don't issue it actually. Okay. So that really solves this problem that you know there won't be any instruction after this accepting instruction in the pipeline. But how do you really answer this question? It's not at all easy. How do you know that this multiplication is going to take an exception in the end seven stage? How does this particular decoder sitting here can say that? Right. So it's possible you have to design the hardware in that way so that every functional unit checks for exception before starting the computation. In the very first stage, the multiplier could actually check if this instruction is going to take an exception or not. Okay. That's possible actually. It can examine the operands and can figure out if there is an there's going to be an exception or not. So this is exactly what is done in um, MIPS R2000, R3000, R4000, and Intel Pentium. So they actually uh, stall instruction issue if there's a chance of an exception happening in any of the instructions prior to it. So we'll talk about R4000 very soon, uh, see how it actually does that. Any question on this? Okay, um, 
So a little bit about uh, pipelining a CISC ISA. Till now we have been looking at a RISC ISA where we have these you know, um, simple instructions where you know where an instruction requires what resource, like in which stage it will access memory and so on and so forth. Um, in CISC ISA you have widely varying latency of instructions um, that magnifies the problems of the floating point pipeline by a large amount, which we have seen here. And worse, there could be data hazard within instruction. So that we have never encountered in MIPS. That you usually have hazards from one instruction to another. Here, you can have data hazard within instruction because the same register may be read and written to multiple times within one instruction. So VAX 8800 um, invented something called micro instructions. What is that? You essentially translate CISC instruction to a sequence of risk-like simple instructions. And since 1995, your Intel architecture uses this thing. So essentially, internally, um, your x86 instructions get transmitted to uh, risk-like micro instructions. Okay, so that takes care of many bad things about the CISC um, ISA. Okay. What about precise exceptions in a CISC ISA? Um, it looks extremely hard to support uh, because instructions modify few states at different times and possibly multiple times. It's not as well defined in, in a risk architecture. Okay. Uh, for example, you can think of a string copy instruction, which could actually take multiple page faults. Because, for example, you can, you can try to copy uh, a particular string spanning multiple pages to some other place spanning multiple pages. Source pages can take page faults, the destination pages can take page faults. Okay. So maybe it can happen that you have copied some part of the string and then you encounter a page fault. Because when you move to the second page, you find the page is not there. Right? So uh, there could be many problems in handling precise exception. So one easy solution here could be that before you start doing anything, you make sure that all the pages that you need are in memory. Okay? So you touch all the pages, bring all the pages, and then start string copy. Okay. Um, you can use history or future file, as we have discussed, but CISC makes that hard too. Why is that? We've actually already discussed why that is so. In CISC, it's just you know magnified multiple times. What else? Exactly. Exactly. So because of this problem, right? Same register may be written written to multiple times within one instruction. So the problem of versions gets magnified several times in this particular ISC. So uh, the same instruction may require actually multiple versions of the same register. Uh, because you can have an exception anywhere in an instruction. Suppose you have uh, written to some register two, uh, three times. You need to write to it maybe seven more times. Now you have an exception. So you may have to uh, maintain all these versions. So VAX decided to save and restore partially completed instructions. So essentially what you're saying now is that you maintain state to decide where to start. So maybe you have copied part of a string and then you take an exception. You, you just you know, remember that, that okay, I have done this much of work in this instruction. I'll resume the execution in the middle of that instruction. Okay. So now essentially you are changing the, the precise exception definition a little bit. We are saying that you don't really resume at the beginning of an instruction. You can actually resume in the middle of an instruction also. Because exceptions now can happen in the middle of instructions. OK. so. Um, I'll quickly go over this particular processor. It just uh, shows um, uh, that the pipeline bypass and all these things just from a slightly different perspective um, compared to a five-stage pipe. So uh, this one, this particular processor implements a 64-bit MIPS IS, unlike your uh, MIPS R3000, which is a 32-bit uh, MIPS processor. And um, R4K is a family, and um, R4400 is a member of that family. We discuss. It has an eight-stage pipeline. Um, essentially, what they have done is uh, uh, they have taken this five-stage pipe and has decomposed further to gain in terms of frequency. So, what are these five stages? You have a fetch stage, which um, uh, selects PC. You have that multiplexer, uh, which selects your PC, and it starts instruction access. Okay. Um, and instruction fetch. Yeah, so starts instruction access. And there is a second cycle um, 
which actually completes the structure fetch. So now we have two cycle fetch, although pipeline. All right. Third stage is register file access, where you actually get to know if the instruction cache actually hit or not. This is very interesting. So you start the second stage of the pipe without actually knowing whether you hit the instruction cache or not. You get to know it only in this particular cycle. And if you hit the cache, um, then of course everything is fine. Um, otherwise, whatever you have decoded will be discarded. Okay, because you also start decoding in parallel. Okay, you decode. Um, you also do the hazard check and activate interlock if needed. Because we said that uh, the MIPS philosophy was that you detect all hazards in the decoder and introduce interlock cycles at that point. Okay. Fourth stage is execution, where you execute branches, both condition and target. Um, you also do ALU operations and compute effective address of nodes. Then there are three stages of memory access. That is a data access. Um, DF, DS, there are two stages that, that do the data access. In TC, you get to know if you hit in the data cache. You still don't know actually. At the beginning of the cycle, you only get to know whether the data that you are dealing with is actually correct or wrong. Okay. And also in this stage, you complete the store. Okay. So um, essentially, how do you do a store? You first look up the, so suppose you, are, you have a cache box, right, which is 64 bytes. And a store operation will be modifying, let's say, four bytes somewhere. So you first read out the cache block completely, modify those four bytes, and then write it back to the cache. Okay, right? So, um, so these data accesses actually get you this 64 byte out of the cache. All right. And in this cycle, in the TC cycle, you get to know if the if it all the cache hit actually. Okay. And then you do the store. Okay. So the question now is, um, what am I really accessing in the cache without knowing if it's a hit or not? Can anybody guess I mean, what's the meaning of this? What's going on? Same thing here, right? I'm saying that you start an instruction access, you do an instruction fetch, but you really don't know whether you hit the cache or not. Because usually the way you understand is that you first look up the cache. If you hit, you access the data, right? So what is going on here? I'm doing it the opposite way. How do you figure out if there's a cache hit? Somebody? Or maybe okay, I'm sorry. Do you know caches? Did 220 cover caches? Maybe. Who does not know what a cache is? Business. Oh, everybody knows. Okay. Right. So what how do you detect the cache? Tags and see if the valid bit is set. Match the tag. We see whether the valid bit is set or not. Okay. And then the valid bit of what? The cash block. Of the cash block. Okay. Which uh, it should be valid. All right. Then uh, the tag should be matched. Match against. Against the uh, uh, address of the, uh, the, uh, the first bit. So um, from, the, from the given address, we take out some part of it, which is called a tag. And we match that against um, whatever is stored in the cache, right? In that block, the tag of that block, right? If they match and the valid bit is set, we say it's a cache it, which means I can now access the data. I'm doing it here in the opposite way. I first access the data and then check if the data was valid or not. Can I do that? How do I access the tag? How, how do I get this one actually? Cache is an array of blocks. So how do I locate this particular tag? How do I locate the block? Okay, I'll tell you. Anyway, so, so there are some bits which are called index bits in the address, which you use to find out which block to get, right? Okay. And uh, so, so this will actually point to, this is my cache, will point to some block. And this block will have data. 
tag and a valid bit. Right? Okay. And essentially this is what I'm using here. Okay, right? So nothing really stops me. So I have the address from my instruction. Let's suppose I have a load instruction. Or if I have the program counter, I have this full address with me. So I, I can calculate the index. And nothing stops me from accessing the data without accessing the tag. Right? Because the data will also be at the same index. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm doing here. I access the data. I access the tag in parallel. And while I'm accessing the data, I make this comparison later and figure out if this data was actually correct or not. Okay. So that's what I'm doing here. Why does it, why does it help? It helps because now these two operations are not serialized. Tag check, tag access, tag check, and data access. I can actually do them in parallel. I can save time. What am I losing? I'm losing a lot of power in my cache. I invest, I actually spend a lot of um, energy here now because some of, the, some of the data accesses are going to be useless. Okay. So I end up burning energy. Okay. So, so all the, all the tags in a set are actually accessed? All the, yes, yes. Well, for a set associative cache, well, yes. For a set associative cache, this is, this is going to be much more difficult. So you have to you have to access all the data and pick one of them depending on that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So so there you'll you'll end up spending even more amount of power. So this uh, forty four hundred users. I don't that remember that exactly. It will it will have at least a two ways in cache. Sure. Yeah. So does does everybody follow what he's mentioning? So he's saying that if you have an associative cache, I'll end up actually doing more useless work. But this is these are done to save time. Okay. All right. Otherwise, I won't be able to do this in three cycles. I will need to be even more temperature. Okay. Same here. Exactly same thing. Okay. And then finally, I do the register write back. So what are the implications? I have a load delay of two cycles. Let's see what that means. That's my pipeline, right? So let's suppose that this is a load instruction, this particular one, okay? So the value is available here, right? But I don't know the value is correct until I get to this stage, right? Is that clear to everybody? Because this is where I get to know if the cache actually, the, the data that I'm, that I'm using is valid or not, okay? So now think of, a, think of an instruction that uses the loaded value. For example, this instruction could be load word R2, 0 or 1, and then after that you have an add instruction which uses R2, R3, R2, R2, let's say. All right? So it needs the value. So let's try to see what happens to this instruction. So this instruction fetches here, issues here, register file access. So it needs the value here. So there is no bypass on this on SART that can get in that value. It's impossible. The value is available here, and I only get to know if it's correct here. So I need, if I, if, I, if I introduce two cycle stalls, I'm of course again assuming that all stalls are introduced after this particular stage, in the deco after, after the decoder, the interlock stalls. So I stall it for two cycles. I move the execution here. Then I can at least get the value. I still don't know if it is correct or not. And this is where things get very interesting. So they say that the load delay stall is actually two cycles. And these are the two cycles. But I'm, I'm not yet sure if I'm doing the computation correct. Okay. So what you do is, you, you are actually making a speculation here. You're saying that, well, what is the common case? The cache heat rate is usually very high. So most of the time, I'm going to be correct if I use the value. There will be some cases where I'm going to be wrong, okay, right? So essentially, um, in those cases, you'll have to roll back one cycle and re-execute the next stage. Okay. 
So it may happen that at the end of this stage, you get to know, oh, this value actually was a cache miss. So essentially what you do is now, you introduce no ops in the pipe, and you keep these instructions stored here until the don't miss results. It is going to take some time actually for the data to come back. Okay. So these are actually called a blind speculation, where you are not using any history. You are just relying on the fact that caches are good. So they are going to give you majority of its minority of misses. Okay. Um, so this is called load hit miss speculation. This is widely used today in all microprocessors. They use a more sophisticated predictor. These are predictions, right? That's what I'm telling you. That's, that's what I'm doing. They'll actually look at the history of this particular load instruction and decide if it is going to hit or miss in the cache. The worst case is three cycles, as I just mentioned. Also, you need a hardware to back up by one cycle. Because miss may take longer, the backup hardware turns the dependent issue in last cycle to a no one. And then stalls the pipe until the miss happens. So essentially, you turn this into a no one and keep this instruction stalled here until the, the load data is available. The pipeline interlock is implemented to stall dependent for two cycles, and the interlock is actually decided here in the decoder. Okay. So whenever this situation arises, it, this decoder can figure out, and then it will not issue this instruction for two more cycles. Wait here, and then send it here, and again to do a tag check here, and if needed, introduce a NOAA and stall instruction. This is here. Okay. Branch delays three cycles. This is much easier to understand, actually. So I assume that this is a branch instruction. So I produce my branch target and condition here. Okay. So um, I cannot fetch here. I cannot fetch here. I cannot fetch here. I can fetch here. And three cycle branch delay. All right. Um, and one of these is filled by the compiler, which is your 